Hello, in this video, I'm going to take a closer look at nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. So in the previous couple of videos, we've been looking at binding energy and mass defects and such like. And we got to the point of talking about the binding energy per nucleon inside an atomic nucleus. And this is the key part of uh, everything that's happening here in nuclear fission and fusion. Right. So I'm going to start, though, with a... Uh, a, a sort of rough sketch of a chart that you'll probably end up seeing quite a lot, which makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. So on the x-axis, we've got um, the atomic number, essentially. So we're going up the periodic table as we're going from left to right on here. And on the y-axis, we've got the binding energy per nucleon. So... This is then just sort of averaging things out because we can't just do a plot of binding energy because, of course, the binding energy, the more nucleons you've got, that's going to keep on going up and up and up. So we want to look at, well, how much binding energy you get in per nucleon so we can then compare the, um, you know, the potential energy sort of associated with one nucleon in an atomic nucleus. I mean, I know potential energy is for the whole system. But it's allowing us to compare across elements um, of uh, so for nuclei of different size. And what you see on this, and we'll go through this in a little bit of detail, is you get this uh, sort of jaggedy approach at the beginning. Um, I'm not going to be able to get this to scale, but it's the shape that that really matters on this. So you get this variation here where we've got a peak. We've got a clear peak where you've got an element which has got the highest binding energy per nucleon. So it's the most stable atomic nucleus that we've got around. Because remember that high binding energy means that we've got the most negative potential energy. They're the most, it's a nucleus where your nucleons are uh, bound together in the strongest, most stable way, because, of course, binding energy is the energy you need to put in to separate all of these nucleons. So our most stable nucleus is going to be the one with the highest binding energy per nucleon. And that turns out to be um, iron. So we've got 56, 26. So that's our iron. Now, if we're on either side of iron, as in we've got something which is a lighter element or we've got something which is a heavier element, whichever way we're moving on the periodic table, we've got a possibility of moving towards. So let's turn these arrows around, moving towards something more stable. So if we've got some uh, elements that are lighter, we've got these light atomic nuclei and we can fuse them together. So lots of small ones and then fuse these together into something bigger. We've got an opportunity there of moving to something more stable, something which has got more negative um, potential energy, a higher binding energy. And the difference between the two of them, the difference between these binding energies, this is going to be the energy that's released. And that's also going to translate to a difference in mass. That's our mass defect. Remember all that from the previous video. Uh, because we've got our E equals MC squared from our uh, mass energy equivalents. So we've got that option for the lighter stuff. We can fuse them together and move up to something more stable. Or for the heavier stuff, we can start with something that's big and we can split it apart. In which case, we've got the same thing going on. We've got now the more stable stuff is the smaller bits. But again, it's the fact that it's the products that are more stable than what we started with and then you get the energy release again so this is what we're uh, looking at here this is fusion where we're combining them this is fission where we're splitting them up but the idea be behind each one of them is you know pretty is the same really um so you know as an example if you've got um so the binding energy per nucleon for deuterium, so this is a part of a process that would go on inside of a of a star, is 1.1 mega electron volts. So that is, remember, electron volt 
is um, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, as in it's the energy of an electron that's been accelerated through one volt. So we'd have 1.1 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 of joules. So that's not a lot. Yeah, you know, we're looking at what's that? 1.76 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Um, that's the um, oh, that's the binding energy per nucleon. So if we've taken a proton and a neutron and we've bound that together, so we've now got two nucleons. So we're going to have double this. Um, two times that, two times that. Uh, so, yeah, we've got about 3.5 times 10 to the minus 13 joules if we bind together a proton and a neutron into deuterium. And that's going to come out as, you know, maybe a photon of energy. So that's not a lot. So, you know, and obviously, if you think uh, stars where this sort of process is going on um, in order to power the stars, uh, they've got a lot of energy coming out. So you need an enormous number of these reactions going on. But, you know, these things are pretty small, protons and neutrons and stars are pretty big. So there's plenty of them around in order for these uh, reactions to happen. But you've got this sort of process of, well, this is our binding energy per nucleon. And we'll be able to say this with all of them. I mean, we're getting up to about 10 MeV for our most stable ones for when we got up to iron. Um, so we're just looking at the calculation of what we had before compared to what we've got afterwards. You know, let's look at all of the products that have gone in and work out the binding energy that we've got for all of those by looking at, well, what they are, you know, whether they're an element or, or not, or just particles coming in from infinity. Work out all the binding energy there, work out the binding energy on the other side, and then that difference is the energy release. So that's what we're going to be doing with both of these. One little thing about this jaggedy uh, effect that we're seeing here, there are more stable nuclei for the lighter elements. So you've got the helium, um, uh, carbon, so helium-4, carbon-12, uh, oxygen-16. These are particularly stable. So these are the ones that are going to be at the peaks here, because remember, the higher up we are, this is more stable as you go upwards, because they're more bound. Um, You'll notice here that we've got these multiples. You've got the same number. They're all powers. Uh, you've got a lot of powers of two kicking around. And you've got the same number of protons and neutrons. Now, I'm not going to claim that, um, you know, there's a really simple explanation for all of this. But again, this is going to be sitting inside of quantum chromodynamics. And, you know, I was saying about in previous videos about how the protons and neutrons can arrange themselves inside an atomic nucleus into energy levels similar to how we describe electrons outside of the nucleus. Well, yeah, this is going to be something which is explained through these various symmetries and and uh, behaviours as described by quantum chromodynamics of these protons and neutrons filling up these energy levels according to the Pauli exclusion principle. So that's why you're going to be getting certain symmetries there. Um, obviously, again, that is way beyond what uh, what we're looking at in these videos. Right. So this is the basic approach that we're looking at. So I'll just say a couple of things about fission and fusion in particular. So fission is, well, this is the main uh, form of nuclear reaction that we as humans have actually utilised. You know, this is what's going on in our nuclear power stations um, and the first atomic bombs and, and such like. So in 1938, the combination of uh, Lisa Meitner and uh, Otto Frisch, they came across um, induced nuclear fission. So the idea of induced nuclear fission is, say, um, we want to get um, uranium. Yeah, you know, this is a, a common fuel that we, we use in, in nuclear reactors. So you get hold of some uranium. So most uranium that you find naturally is uranium-238, which is fairly stable. That's about 99% of 
the uranium that you just find lying around if you go mining it. But there is uranium-235, which is the stuff that you want in nuclear reactors and, uh, and nuclear bombs and things like that. And it's, it's radioactive, but you can encourage it to split. So we're wanting, you know, we've got something that's obviously sitting much higher up the periodic table here than, than iron. And we want it to move in that direction towards the more stable forms, the more stable elements. So we want to split this and it will do, but we can induce fission. We can induce the uranium-235 to split by uh, firing slow neutrons at it. And this is what Meitner and Frisch discovered. So if you've got some slow neutrons and you're essentially making the nucleus more unstable by loading it up with, with neutrons, getting it more unbalanced in, in the way it's behaving. So you fire these slow neutrons in and then that might split into, say, I mean, it can split in lots of different ways. You might get barium 141 and krypton 92, something like that. Uh, so you might get those coming out and then you'll get more neutrons. You might get multiple neutrons then coming out of here. I don't know how many you'd get on this particular quite often. You'll get maybe, I don't know, three neutrons or something like that come out. You can then use those neutrons if you slow them down to then go back in and induce more fission. This is where we're getting a chain reaction in these nuclear reactions. Um, so, but yeah, it's this idea of induced fission that we can have control over this. So what we're looking at for creating a fission reactor or a fission bomb is to get our percentage of uranium 235 up to maybe two or three percent so that's where they start using centrifuges and things like that you know if you get a uranium sample spin it around a lot then that effect of the circular motion is going to separate the 238 and the 235 and we can get a concentration of uranium 235 in one part of the sample and if we concentrate it up enough, then it's going to allow us to set up this fission chain reaction where we can keep inducing it to uh, split apart, keep splitting the atom over and over again. And then the energy release that you get on this, I mean, you're getting about 85 percent of the energy goes into the kinetic energy of the what's called the daughter nuclei. So these are the ones that are produced. So say the barium and the krypton. You might get 3% of the energy going into the uh, into kinetic energy of the neutrons. You might get, say, 7% into photons um, and 5% into, say, neutrinos. And we can capture these in various ways. You, know, you can have them heating up things. You know, the, the photons can heat things up. You can have the uh, neutrons when they're being slowed down, and we'll talk about this when we look at more in, uh, nuclear reactors in more detail, but when they're being slowed down, taking the kinetic energy out of them can be used to heat up materials, you know, so you're heating up water or something that's uh, um, inside the reactor. So you've got ways of taking the energy away, and that's what we're then uh, using in the power station. So that's our overview there of fission. So the key thing there is we've got induced nuclear fission. So you really want to remember this is the induced part of it. That's the really important part of firing those neutrons in to uh, make an atomic nucleus unstable. As for fusion, there's, I mean, there's a little bit less to say about that at the moment, but this is what goes on in stars. We're trying to get fusion. You know, we've, we've successfully had nuclear fusion in the lab. Uh, created by humans on Earth. They're trying to get to the state of creating fusion reactors to replace the fission reactors because um, in a lot of ways, although not in all ways, the, the waste products of fusion reactors are far less harmful than they are for fission reactors. I mean, certainly in terms of the fuel, you're not having to use things like uranium and plutonium and getting some really horrible stuff coming out of it from the actual uh, nuclear process, you can have some issues kicking around in the, um, the actual material used to build the reactor itself. But we get onto that in another video again, where we look at fusion reactors. But there's been some uh, good progress made, things like the ITER project in France for building um, a fusion reactor 
it's still not got to the stage where it's able to produce more energy than is required to get it going you know we need to have a um a net output of energy to make these things viable haven't quite got to that point yet but progress is being made the problem of course with fusion is um it needs to be very very hot i mean you know stars are very very hot and the reason for this is we need to get these nuclei in order to fuse we need to get them about a femtometer apart so around 10 to the minus 15 meters apart you know this is what we were talking about with the strong nuclear force in the previous video this is the range that is operating over give or take so to get these nuclei or particles close enough together that they're actually going to fuse requires a lot of energy so you need high density high temperature high pressure that's very hard to maintain. So there's difficulties actually maintaining that inside a, a fusion reactor. You know, we don't have the same issue with fission because, I mean, if, if, any, if anything, we want to slow down these neutrons. We want to take energy out of a, a large, an important part of the system in order for the process to happen. So we're wanting to take energy away in the fission reactor, which is so much easier to do. You know, it's not to say that fission reactors don't get hot. I mean, of course they do. They're producing energy or um, at least releasing energy. You know, we can't just manufacture it out of thin air, obviously, um, conservation of energy and all that. But it's releasing energy and that's going to make things hot. But, you know, we can manage it in certain ways and providing we don't have things going into meltdown, then everything's hunky dory in terms of the actual process of initiating and perpetuating these nuclear reactions but it's so much more difficult in fusion so we'll look at both of these processes the fission and the fusion in two separate videos that are going to come up but that's an overview of everything that's going on in those two processes but you can see they're very similar in their underlying concepts of this binding energy per nucleon